This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Welcome to another edition of Biblical Life TV. It's been a while since we've been able to film. Between the fake pandemic, which now is coming out more than ever before that it's fake, uh, they're fudging the numbers. There's uh, Derek Gilbert, uh, if you have not watched 5 and 10, uh, quotes from, I believe it was the New York Times, that the actual number of those that have died from COVID instead of with COVID are actually under 7,000. And uh, what's sad about this is now the medical community worldwide has lost all credibility. And we see that it was politically motivated, that there are those that would rather cost the, the people of this nation millions of billions of dollars and lost income and heartache and worry just to gain power. And uh, we're actually going to be dealing with some of that today in what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. And this is uh, Understanding the Kingdom, part 81. And I'm going to entitle this, Seeking and Moving in the Kingdom. This is a teaching of Jesus that everyone is familiar with. Jesus' teaching on prayer said, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him that knock it is open. Now, I want you to underline a couple of things in your Bible. Seek and find. One of the principles that we have in prayer and moving in the kingdom of God is that what you're seeking you find. Okay? Now, if I were the enemy, what I would do is get you seeking all the wrong things. It's kind of like that old song, looking for love in all the wrong places. If I can get you to seek something other than the kingdom, if I can try to redefine the kingdom, if I can try to cause physical needs and, and that which Jesus said the Gentiles are so constantly seeking. If I can get you to seek that, you're never going to find the kingdom because you're not seeking it. Now, for some, we just, I think we just need to break this down. Kingdom is actually a condensing of the king's domain. How many know here in America, the Queen of England has no bearing on what Mike Lake does. I'm outside her domain. Or if there was a king in another country, I am outside of their domain. When we start talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about his domain, and his domain is only where he absolutely rules and reigns. And if we do not get that basic understanding of the kingdom then we're seeking all the wrong things. Now what is the church in America, what is it really seeking? 
Well, you know, in Laodicea, you seek prosperity and you seek blessing. I remember back at the height of the prosperity message that having a jet, having a Mercedes, I I remember I I even knew one minister, you know, and, and, and he talked about driving his Mercedes. Now it was a 30 year old Mercedes, but it was still a Mercedes, and so he was prosperous. And we, we had these icons, well, I drive a Lexus, I drive this, I drive that, showing that we're blessed of God. Well, the interesting thing is Jesus didn't know anything more than what was on his back. He moved in the kingdom and he was prosperous because he had whatever he needed for the moment. We cannot define things by the world system. We need to define them by the Word of God. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, just walk in the kingdom today. How about this in many circles? Spiritual power and influence. Trying to win friends and influence people and all these different things. You know, Jesus never really sought to influence anybody. He just went preaching those that heard, heard those that rejected, rejected. He called them out for their hypocrisy. But it wasn't about building a base. It wasn't about building a movement. We have too many today that are seeking to build their own kingdoms rather than the kingdom of God. Do you know the difference? And, and luckily, I've got, I've got some men that, that I deal with in ministry that you can hear the difference, okay? If doing what God wants to do can, will cost my ministry, or I've got to set some things aside, or, or take this ministry out of the spotlight to do what God is wanting done, I will do that. I've actually got men around me that have that attitude, that I, I can, we, we've talked about it, we, we, have, we have expressed it in many ways. That's the kingdom of God first. There are some times, when you, when you look even in, in, in Judges and the, and the different things, of how God would work the battle. Sometimes he would raise up a captain or a general that would be over a fight, and then he would raise down, go back to farming. And then in the next conflict, God would raise up another general, and the old general is more than willing to stay down, saying, okay, the anointing's on you. God's hand is on you. You lead. I'll fight. I'll, I got your back. That's the way the kingdom is supposed to work. But instead, we're worried, we're worried about either becoming superpowered or everybody know our name. You know, I'd rather pray for somebody and just kind of, you know, Jesus, there were several times he just, he just kind of went, healed somebody, and went back in the crowd, and who healed you? I don't know. <laughs> because it wasn't about making a name. It was about moving in the kingdom and bringing and meeting a need at that moment. How about this one? If this doesn't sound very American, to feel better about themselves. Well, I can tell you how you can feel better about yourself. You can repent get free from sin, and surrender at the feet of Jesus, and you start getting better and better and better every day. You know, it's interesting in the the mega church movement, when you begin researching its origin, it goes back to several churches that were struggling, growing, and so they did a canvas in their neighborhoods of what would you like in a church? Do you know? And if you look at some churches, bowling alley, Starbucks, <laughs> you know, all these different things, and they said, we want to feel better about ourselves. Well, that is a natural byproduct of getting free from sin and begin moving in kingdom, let God begin restoring you. You start feeling better. It is a byproduct, not the central focus. And yet we have ministries today that their focus is we just need to get people to feel better. And the end result is you can have people feeling better all the way to the point where they die and slide straight into hell. They were feeling really good about themselves until they were met with the reality because we're to give a warning. Sin is real. Hell is real. Heaven is real. Righteousness is real. Judgment's real. It's all a part of the king's domain. How about this one? Relief or avoidance of that which is not pleasurable. 
You know, sometimes God has got to get you so uncomfortable that you're willing to change. Okay? I call it holy discontentment. And there's been some times in my life in this ministry, it's like, okay, I'm so fed up with doing things the old way. It's not working. I'm done with it. Let's just reboot this thing and have a different focus. And in many circles, it's religious entertainment. Tell me something I don't know. Well, I can tell you a lot you're not implementing. You may know it, you're just not implementing it. And we're all guilty of that. If we start seeking the wrong things, then before heaven can get us moving in the right direction, they've got to get us stuck off of stupid. Okay? And I can say that about me. There's been many times in my life God is saying, listen, Mike, I want to do something in your life, but you're so stuck on stupid, you're seeking the wrong things, and so I've got to get them to lose their light, their luster. They, they've got to lose their attractiveness. I've got to change your heart to get you to start asking for the right things. Otherwise, I'm never going to get you where I need you to be. And I think right now when a lot of things that are going on in the world today is a part of God saying, you have been asking for all the wrong things. There's a lot of people right now that are looking at, at sports and saying, you know, that really doesn't meet the need that it used to. It's not about sports anymore. It's about political agendas and about this and about that. And then they dare start researching and find out there was a time in the world that only children played baseball and football and soccer. And there was a guy named H.G. Wells. Anybody ever hear of him? The time machine. I mean, he was embedded neck deep into the Luciferian elite. In fact, he was friends with the same group where we get concepts like evolution, eugenics, the Darwins, all these different things. And he wrote a book called The New World Order. You can probably find it on Google Books and read it online for free. In his time, what he postulated is for people to accept the New World Order, we're going to have to cause tribalism that really doesn't do a thing. Not nationalism, tribalism. And we should do it through sports. How many know, except for the guys who win the Super Bowl this year, they get a big fat check and a very expensive ring, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything about the World Series. It will not change your life. It will not draw you closer to God. It will not add one penny. Sometimes it takes away a lot of pennies out of your life because you identify in something that is hype but produces no lasting results. Well, Mike, what's that like? Have you ever heard of the Colosseum in Rome to where the Romans wanted people to forget how bad it was? And so they would have gladiator games and free food during it to appease the people so they would be so involved in that they wouldn't look into politics. But that's a whole other topic. And all of this, you know, for a time God took away sports, God, you know, Hollywood's not making movies, all these different things. For us to draw back and say, how much does it really matter? You know, I heard in one of the movies, you know, Thor's hammer got shattered or something like that. Thor lost his hammer. Big deal. <laughs> Maybe he got a bigger one. I don't know. You see, those things just really don't matter, but it's, it's placating us. It's getting us focused on all the wrong things. All the time, it is literally the matrix that is placed over our eyes to where we're not seeking the kingdom. Because if the body of Christ today would begin crying out for the kingdom, hell would tremble. Okay? Okay? Jesus set the priorities. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34.
Therefore don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. In fact, the Greco-Roman culture was absolutely consumed by what to eat and what to wear. And having the nicest and keeping up with the Joneses. So much so that in, in Roman times, they would have these great banquets. I forgot if it's bulimia or which one it is where you cause yourself to throw up. They, they would go and they would do that so they could go back and eat all over again and just keep the feast going and keep the feast going because it was consuming and consuming and having the best. Jesus said, don't do that. You know, I can get by with decent food here because I know there's a wedding feast one day waiting for me. And let me tell you something, there will be no acid reflux, you won't have to count the calories, and you don't have to worry about it being gluten-free or not. I mean, God, we're, we're going to feast with Almighty God. So it's okay to just try to eat healthy and not be so consumed by what we consume here. All of this is transitory. All this is temporary. As much as pharaohs built pyramids literally trying to take it with them they didn't take anything with them because the looters came and looted and if the looters didn't get it the museums did they took absolutely nothing with them all you can take with you is what you've done for the kingdom that's it jesus reminds us for your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things but seek first the kingdom of God. Did he say second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth? Now, in this in the same vein of teaching, Jesus said, What you seek after you get. If you seek after the things of the flesh, if you seek after riches, if you seek after these things. And we were already told in the Proverbs, he who is anxious to get wealth will not go unpunished. I read that and say, you know, I think I went out of that line. What God blesses me with, he blesses me with, because I realize it's a natural product of walking in the kingdom and walking in the commandments of God. But he didn't stop at the kingdom, and he says, and these righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. So the secret to having your needs met is seeking first the kingdom and the righteousness of the king. You know, every once in a while, and you know, I'm a giver, I love to give, I, Mary and I look for places where there's need, and let me tell you something, there's, when you start feeding hungry babies, that's just something to get excited about, okay? But we have, we, we're, the, 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 the thing of, of sowing seed, and they, because I remember when Seed Faith first came out by Earl Roberts, and it wasn't all about money, it was sowing to somebody's life, showing love praying for people. Yeah, you may give money, but there's a lot of other things to give, and somehow it's all been reduced to money. So that we, like the government, we have a problem. We throw money at it. How has that worked out for the government? They just keep on wadding. You know, it used to be they would throw millions, and then it was billions. Now they're throwing trillions. If you have to borrow, you ought not be throwing that wad of money, Okay. And it, it just vaporizes before it even hits the wall. I'm just amazed. But we have Christians doing the same thing. They throw money at it in desperation when the Apostle Paul said, don't give out of necessity. That's desperation. We need a course correction. That when we seek first the kingdom and his domain and seek to walk in his righteousness, I begin changing the things that I'm doing. You know, if what you're doing isn't working, maybe you need to change some things that you're doing. You know, I found out, you know, years ago, I remember listening to this comedian. He said, you know what? He says, I don't eat diet food because the only people that eat it are fat. And so my remedy was Doritos, chips, you know, Taco Bell, all these different things. And how many know you come to the place that, okay, what I'm doing 
and sitting behind the computer all day and all these things. I can pray all I want to lose weight, but until I get up off my blessed assurance and start moving more instead of just sitting eight hours a day in front of a computer, I'm not going to lose weight. There has to be a different action to get a different result. And if the action is based upon seeking first the kingdom, that which I'm seeking I will find according to Jesus. And when I do, then the things that I need will be added to me. Oh, but you need to underline and his righteousness. Oh, Walking in the ways of God, his righteousness, walking as Jesus would walk. In fact, if there was any confusion at all, the word first in the Greek is proton, which means first in place in any succession of a thing or person, or first in rank. First at the first. Not to be second, not to be confused with the second. That which is preeminent. We need to add, one of the things that, that has helped me more than anything personally, because I know me, I am prone to get stuck on stupid, and Mary can give, you know, a testimony about that. I get something in my head, and it, it, God has to get his hammer, you know, not Thor's hammer, he has to get a hammer sometimes to hit me in the head to get me off of it. And... I need that adjustment. And one of the things that happens when we start seeking first the kingdom, we open the door for God to begin adjusting what we think, what we say, how we feel, and what we do. Because if he begins adjusting those to a kingdom paradigm, then we start getting kingdom results. Not until then. Now, I love here what the New International Commentary says. Again, it says, The language of priority, which underlines verses 29 through, uh, 19 through 21 and 24, now again made an explicit call to make it your priority to find the kings, the God's kingship and righteousness. That's what differentiated Jesus' ministry from everybody else's in the New Testament times. That's why they, they said he's not like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He speaks and he moves in authority. Why does he move in authority? He's seeking God's kingship and his righteousness. And it goes on to say, it said, uh, the verb here used for seek echoes the strong compound verb that, uh, which is used for Gentiles' anxious quest for material provision in the previous verse. Disciples by contrast, and so here Jesus is contrasting what the Gentiles do, the Greeks and the Romans, compared to what his disciples should do, which is a very Hebraic concept of contrasting. They run after stuff all the time. You run after God all the time. Disciples, by contrast, have a different orientation, a higher purpose in life. And I think that's what Jesus was talking about. He says, when you lay down this low life and reach for the high life. You know, if you, if you just keep for the lower life, it brings death. You reach for this higher life, and it begins bringing life to you. Because you can chase after the things of this world forever and never catch them. You know, all the evils going on today are by self-appointed billionaires that their billions aren't enough. For the bankers, it's not enough. And I'm talking about the international bankers. It's not enough. And it's not even enough that they basically control nations. They want to control aspe every aspect of our lives. That's part of the new world order. So having a bunch, and that's what you seek, puts you completely over on the dark side. To where they're so paranoid or whatever their, whatever their paradigm is, that they have got to micromanage every life of every human being on the earth before that desire is cessated. Boy, I don't want a part of that. That's mystery Babylon. That's, that's the working of sin. 
We must first seek the kingdom, guys. When we start walking in the ways of God, following the commandments of God, we're actually doing what Jesus would do. You see, if he was the lamb without sin, that means he never violated a single commandment of God in all the years he walked on planet Earth. He was tempted like you and me. The temptation was there, but he chose not to. And guys, through the, the power of the gospel, when I'm set free, the exousia, the very word we use for authority. Jesus said, you know, after he resurrected, he said, Behold, all authority is given unto me, now you go. That word also means the power of choice. Only a saved man can say no to sin and choose righteousness. Because it was the grace of God and the act of salvation. Only the new creature in Christ Jesus can reject sin and choose the way of God. And our choosers have grown stale and they've been stuck on sin instead of righteousness because some of our theologies and different things. Every moment that Jesus walked the earth, he was moving in authority of the second Adam to choose the kingdom. And he is our example. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. You want to start having power in prayer? Power in prayer kind of echoes the old song back, I think it was from the 70s or 80s, I'm starting to show my age, the decades are beginning to be like, give me that thing, give me, give me that thing, give me, give me that thing. That's prayer life. I want this, and I want this, and I want this. You might as well exchange the throne of God for Santa Claus sitting on his throne, because that's what we have done with prayer. If you ever notice when Jesus teaches on prayer here, just how far down the list meet our daily needs is. It's way down there. Why you seek first the kingdom, it's a natural byproduct. May not be what your flesh wants, but it's what you need. Okay? God didn't say, I'm going to give you all your wants, because how many know our wants are limitless? You can especially see that with a small child, and he gets in a department store, or back when Toys R Us was here, and they have no concept of money or that you don't have any at the moment, which is for a lot of parents. I remember when I, it was a um, shopper's fair. Uh, this, this is etched in my memory because it was a transition point for me that I realized there was something called money and you had to give stuff to get money. And so mom was shopping and I got, I, I guess I wasn't even in school yet and I got away from her and I found a game that I wanted. It was hands down. I even still remember the game. And so I just marched up to the service deck and had them page her because I couldn't find her so she could buy that for me. How many know that that, did not, that conversation did not go the way that I had expected it? <laughs> Neither did it happen different, did it happen a lot differently once I got home too. Uh, my hands, it wasn't hands down, it was hands across the blessed assurance because I was getting educated when I got home. We, we treat prayer like that. And I'm sure the, fed, this, this, the, the, the Pharisees were basically praying the same way. We need this, we need this, we need to influence people, we need you to back off Caesar, we need this and that and the other. And Jesus' disciples came to him and said, you know what? We have never seen the results in prayer that you get. So we want you to teach us how to pray. Right out of the chute, Jesus said, now after this manner, so in other words, this is an outline. It's not just sitting around going, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you are going through rote to where you're not even paying attention to the words. Have you ever been in a church service where they did that and it, it was like mumbling? It's almost like you're, from an, you're watching one of those old scenes from Dick Tracy where mumbles was there and you couldn't understand a thing. He said, amen. Jesus said, pray after this manner. 
Father, before anything else, I want your name reverenced. I want your name hallowed. That's top priority. In fact, when you look at hallowed hagiadzo in the Greek, it means to render or acknowledge, to be venerated and hallowed. It's to be consecrated. Father, no matter what happens today, I want you to be glorified. In the words that I say and the things that I do, Father, be glorified. May people for even forget who I am. Let, the, the, let them just remember that Jesus was here and that Jesus touched somebody through me. Let them forget who I am and just remember I was touched by the King. You can't pray those kind of prayers without the Holy Spirit going to work on you. Father, be glorified. The next one is a declaration. Your kingdom come. Now Jesus said to seek first the kingdom, but he also is a part of the pattern of prayer. How many days do we cry out, bring the kingdom? Let your kingdom come. Let it get a hold of this earth. And man, there's a lot of earth to get a hold of, Lord. But I know that you were mighty and that you were able to do it. I want your kingdom to come. Let it be in preeminence. It's not my domain. I'm going to walk in your domain. Because there's only two domains in the universe. Forget the nations. There is the kingdom of God and there is the kingdom of darkness. That is it. I don't care what kind of bumper sticker the kingdom of darkness has on it. We under, when you understand that principalities and powers control every nation, control every culture on planet earth, and that the church, the true assembly of those called out of Babylon walking in kingdom, are the only true counterculture on the planet. When you get that clear in your thinking, then the obvious choice is, I want the kingdom of God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. The kingdom is in this book. Waiting as I meditate on it and I study it. The kingdom is waiting to be released and to get a hold of us. <coughs> Jesus didn't stop it. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth. Did you know that when God formed Adam out of the dirt of the earth, he did it so that Adam could take domain over the earth. Dominion. We're, we have earth suits. Your body's not you. I mean, one of these days, you're going to lay that bad boy down. You're going to lay it down, and I get a body 2.0. I'm looking forward to the body 2.0. I'll never have to go to a chiropractor. I'll never need another uh, dose of Advil. It will be an immortal body. I won't need glasses. I remember listening to Chuck Missler talk, and he said, you know, he says, it's kind of like... He, and, and Chuck, when you listen to him, he would use a computer till, till it would hardly work and half the keys worked and finally he'd go get a new one. And hearing him talk, it was like going from a Pentium to one of the newer ones. And he said it was the same software, but he said it was like a hundred times faster. He said, welcome to your mind in a new body. It works so much better. We just replaced one of the computers with our shipping department, and uh, it had a lot of Yosemite Sam cussing being done toward it because it could, it could not keep hold of the internet. It could not keep a hold of it, it had a printer or not, and you wanted to shake it, and, and it was replaced. And the new one, instead of taking five minutes to boot up, it takes five seconds to boot up, and it is such a pleasure to work with. Everything is actually working right. Well, that is, in a sense, in a small way, 
is going to be like the upgraded bodies that we have. I don't think we'll have to sleep. We'll never know a pain again. We'll never know sickness and disease can't touch that body. It's operating at peak efficiency exactly the way that God created for it to. And sin and the effects of sin and death cannot even touch it. Man, I'm looking forward to that. So why are we so consumed about this one? Now, you know, my thing is take care of it and get a good testimony and write that testimony out as long as you can because once your testimony is over, then it's time to go, okay? So get a testimony, stretch it out. But this earth is my first line of authority i got to take hold of. I cannot move in external authority until I learn to move in internal authority. And the way to move in internal authority is your will be done in this old clay vessel. It starts getting done here because we are a vessel. What is a vessel? A vessel is made to hold something. If I am filled with yielding to the king's domain, then the king's domain begins to fill up that vessel. And then Jesus said, basically during the day what I do is I pour out that which my vessel has been filled with, the king's domain, the kingdom. So much so that if you pray for somebody and God touches them and they're healed, you say the kingdom of God has come near you. You want in? You pray for somebody and God answers a prayer and they don't know Jesus. The kingdom of God has just come near you. You want to get in on this thing? Because in this kingdom, this is normal. And how is his will be done? Father, I want you, I want you to be in complete control of me as if I was walking the streets of gold right now. That I was physically seeing your throne. Untouched by Mystery Babylon, untouched by the iniquity force, I want to walk like that now. Help me do it. Well, Mike, that's impossible. It is if you're not seeking it. You only can find what you're seeking. You can only drink from that which you thirst for. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God has got to change us to a kingdom first mentality. That we pray kingdom in every situation. We, how should I respond according to kingdom? There's a way of this world... And the way of the world wants to hide things, wants to lie about things, wants to steal things, wants to do all these things, no matter what, to gain power in all these things. That's the world's way, and it leads to death. Or I can seek God's kingdom. And when I do, God's kingdom will begin manifesting. God's kingdom is His rulership. But there's also a dynamic of the kingdom that we've not realized. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. Jesus changed an entire paradigm of a concept with this verse, or with these verses, that in a sense he brings an antidote to something that only Messiah could bring. I love Dr. Michael Heiser's book, on reversing Hermon. If you don't really know what happened in Genesis 6, you're not really going to understand a lot of Jesus' ministry because he was reversing what the watchers had done. In the Old Testament, when you speak of leaven, you're speaking of the iniquity force or sin. You let sin in, it takes over. As well as the mystery religions. Have you ever read Ecclesiastes? Vanity, all is vanity, vanity this, vanity that, said the richest and wisest man on the planet. If you don't understand Solomon's life, thanks to Hiram Abiff, or Hiram of Tyre, the Masons want to call him Abiff, because he was getting the cedars of Lebanon from him, well, that guy was also a high priest in the mystery religions, and it caused Solomon to get by the mystery religion bug. 
One of the reasons that he married all these strange wild women is because if you married the, in most of those religions, the king was also the high priest over the mystery religion. He knew that that information had been broken up at the Tower of Babel. Okay? And so by marrying all of them, he was getting their pieces of their puzzle through the daughter, which would also be a high priestess in the mystery religions. And that's why you have all these crazy things going on. I mean, Solomon literally builds his palace on one side of Jerusalem, and he builds his wife's palaces on the other side of Jerusalem, and he erects things for Baal, and he brought in the altar of Ashtaroth, where many believe that's actually where the hexagram came from, was off the altar of Ashtaroth. Because he's trying to put all these pieces of the puzzle, the mystery religions, together, and after him trying to do that for years and it corrupted him, he said, it's all vanity. This leaven is all vanity. In fact, there's one of the ancient religions that they claimed to have a secret that would change the world and they had it in the middle of a labyrinth. And kind of following the legend of the Minotaur, they put all kinds of traps, booby traps and everything else in this thing to where a good majority of the, uh, the guys that, okay, I've arrived, I'm getting ready to, to get platinum status in, in the first mystery religion of whatever. And so he would go through about only 2 or 3% of them ever survived. They would die of their wounds and everything else going through this Lambeth. And when they get in there, do you know what they're awarded? One grain of wheat. There's the mystery. I tell you what, there would have been some dead high priests. <laughs> Let me tell you what you can do with this. But that's because so much of it is an illusion so that it can prepare the way for the Antichrist. And even those that are following after the mystery religions believe they're gaining power while they're damning their souls. Okay? That is the leaven of this world. Now Jesus, okay, coming to his ministry with what he's doing, he makes this audacious claim. And another parable he spoke to him said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. Whoa, wait, wait, what, what? From Moses on, leaven was a bad thing. Jesus brought the antidote. Okay. Which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the whole thing was leavened. I mean, a major paradigm shift. The world is full of the leaven of the kingdom of darkness. In fact, you know, before, uh, and you know, there's, there's so many things in the physical realm that illustrate spiritual truth. You know, the old way before they had the yeast packets that so supercharged the, the bread that our bodies are now full of yeast. People are fighting candida and all kinds of other things. How did you get your dough to rise? You would take it and you would set it in your windowsill and you would expose it to the world. Because you naturally have yeast particles floating in all of the atmosphere. And so it taught you... Exposure to the world can get you infected. That's why there always has to be yearly sacrifices and sin sacrifices and all these things because you're constantly getting exposed. Okay. Now Jesus is saying, listen, I'm coming with a different kingdom, with a different atmosphere. And if you're ever exposed to it, it starts to take over. Well, Brother Mike... I don't have the kingdom taken over. That means you've not been exposed to it. You've been exposed to church. You've been exposed to a Jesus. But when you're exposed to the Jesus, and you taste and see that the Lord is good, you always want more. And it slowly starts taking over. I remember there was a famous dancer that uh, went up to D.L. Moody and uh, 
said, you know, this, this Jesus thing really sounds interesting, but, you know, the, the level of holiness that you preach, being an old-time Baptist, I don't think that I can accept Jesus and dance. Because it'd be kind of sinful, right? And D.L. Moody looked at her and smiled, and he says, you give your heart to Jesus, you can dance all you want to. So she went to the altar and got right with God. She came back up to him and said, You knew when I gave my life to Jesus, I wasn't going to want to anymore. You see, that's my king. When I get that, that's why when, we, when God moves and the kingdom moves, that's why Jesus taught his disciples, the kingdoms come near you, I just infected you. With the leaven of the kingdom. Now let me come and let you meet the king. Because when you meet the king, you just want him to take over. Oh. Is that good? And so, if he's not taken over. Because I tell you what, once the kingdom of God gets on the inside of you, it will leaven the whole lump. It will go through every nook and cranny. So this whole concept of being Greek and compartmentalizing yourself to where I got my religious stuff over here that, you know, church is church and business is business and this is this and this is that. That doesn't fly in kingdom because kingdom will creep under the door. Kingdom will creep through the keyhole. I don't care how many padlocks you put on something trying to keep Jesus out. Once you let him in, he's not happy until he's king of everything. He wants to be not only king of your shout, but king of your I got to bring this under control and I don't want to and I really want to tell you what I think, but instead I got to tell you what Jesus thinks. It's called crucifying the flesh. Oh. <laughs> so we need to start crying out for kingdom, don't we? Jesus also went as far, in Matthew 16 and 6, then Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had concocted their own leaven. Or they took worldly leaven and put a Jewish veneer over it. Okay. This is what Adam Clark says about this. Beware of the leaven. When the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees have been explained, has, has been already explained, see Matthew 16, 1. Bad doctrine acts in the soul as leaven does in meal. They assimilate the whole spirit to their own nature. They assimilate the whole spirit to their own nature. That's what leaven does. And so if I'm doing in kingdom, I am being transformed from my old nature to a new nature. But bad doctrine, doctrines of men, will try to get you to conform to its nature rather than the Word of God. He goes on to say, a man's particular creed has a greater influence on his temperament and conduct than most are aware of. Pride, hypocrisy, worldly mindedness, which constituted the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, run the major part of the world. Because they had a veneer of godliness while denying the power thereof. And so, one of the things that we have to do, and Mary and I have been doing this for a long time, question everything. One thing I know is Jesus is Lord. Salvation is only had by the blood of Jesus. Start questioning everything else I've been taught. That's when I stopped being a dispensationalist. That's when I stopped a lot of things. Because you, you see, if it's really of God, it will flow from Genesis to Revelation. And many times people that harp the most about hermeneutical principle when it comes to their pet doctrines throw it completely out the window and instead survive by sound bites. That's a leaven that takes over. One of the things that we, we see in the body, and there's, there is this constant pull and war of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. 
Do you know you can see that in that war going on in your own gut? That's one of the things that medical science is really coming into light of. I mean, the other day, Mary and I, we got, we got some uh, little snack things like trail mix that you can get. It has probiotics in it. Probiotic, pro-life, okay? But there's something that is so filled in our food, it's called candida. And it's constantly warring in your gut to take over. And when it does, it starts calling all kinds of disease, doesn't it? Anybody that's ever had a candida overgrowth knows it causes constant hunger. It can, it's that they're understanding it, it pre-diabetes to heart disease, all these different things go on with this. Because there's a war, if you will, of two types of leaven going on in the gut. And the only way to get the candida under, candida under control is to keep bringing in the probiotics. The only way that we can keep the world out and keep it in control in our life is we have to have a constant flow of the kingdom. That's why Jesus every day, your kingdom come. Seek first the kingdom. Because believer, disciple, the world will seek to change your focus so that it can reaffect you so that you become a worldly-minded believer. A worldly-minded believer will pick up this word and say, God says that's sin, and I don't agree with it. I kind of like that thing. You know what? We're going to change. They're even going and changing the word now. Do you know there are gender-neutral Bibles? God isn't gender-neutral. He doesn't apologize. Said, this is just the way it is. And the moment that you begin changing God, you have gone from worshiping the Creator to an idol. You can put Yahweh on it. Come on. Aaron, I was talking about this with uh, Josh Peck. When you, when you read the Exodus account, Aaron just kind of really fudged on it because he said all the people took the gold, threw it in the fire, and the calf popped out. <laughs> I didn't craft it. It's kind of, whoop, there it was. They called that calf Yahweh. And said, that calf delivered us from Egypt. You can use all the right religious terminology. You can get your Holy Ghost goosebumps and know how to, like you're getting hit with electricity, calling it the Holy Ghost. You can get your Rondai Shondai. You know when people get most excited in church anymore is when they're singing about what God, how God makes them feel, or their God makes them feel, rather than about who He is. There's been a transition. The other day I was here doing some stuff in the office, and I just pulled up what I call some old goldies, Keith Green, Steve Camp. And it was about his holiness, who he was. And now it's all about, he's going to make me feel better. He's going to make me feel better. Things are going to be good because he's going to make me feel better. Oh, boy, just can't you feel the spirit with them? Our worship is out of line. In fact, we have, we have songs with great beats that are theologically inaccurate. Or are they talking about another God? An idol of our own making. The yeast of the other side is coming in. That leaven is coming in like gangbusters. And the only, you cannot, let's, let's say just physically, you, you have to do things to kill the candida at the same time supplement with the right stuff. Repentance kills the leaven of this world while seeking the kingdom brings its leaven. And until you do therapeutic doses of both, you're never going to be free. 
You can talk about being remnant all day long and not be remnant because remnant live, breathe, and die for the king and his kingdom. That's the measure of what a remnant is, a remnant individual is. I live for him, I die for him. Everything is him, anything done good in me is done by him and for him and for his purposes. I die daily so he can live daily through me. Until we're into that groove of repentance to kill and seeking to receive, we're never going to transition to kingdom. It's never going to happen. We can have conferences on kingdom. I can have kingdom blazers made with a little kingdom logo here, you know. All for a thousand dollar offering, you know, all these different things. And you're not doing kingdom. We can go through here and paint everything in gold paint, making it look like it's kingdom. It's not kingdom. Kingdom is the king's dominion. Jesus rule and reign. Anything in me that's not of you has got to die. The old self's got to die. I've got to enter into my priesthood and take that thing and offer it as a sacrifice to be consumed by the fire of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to keep that bad boy there until it's reduced to ash. You know, there's a, you ever, did you ever look at the, the brazen altar? There are four horns on the brazen altar because they tied it down. Do you know what that means? It wasn't a barbecue pit. You don't leave your sin on there long enough so where it was, has smoky flavor so that you can pilot it better, you know, palatable. It's to be reduced to ash. Until it's reduced to ash, it's not a sacrifice, it's simply a barbecue. My king deserves a sacrifice. The more of that, then we get into kingdom, which is in the, the holy place, and the holy of holies. All that is kingdom. All of that is wood covered in gold, humanity covered in holiness. On the outer court, everything is brazen altar, brazen labor, judgment. You can't get to one until the sin has been judged and has been burnt by the fire of the Holy Spirit to be consumed. Then you get the kingdom. And so we need to begin transitioning in what we seek. It's kingdom. But Mike, you don't know, I'm in the middle, of, you know, we're in the middle of this planned demic and, and, you know, the, the, you don't know what they're going to do. I live near a city that the liberal left is this letting burn seek first the kingdom what do you mean god may tell you to hold your ground god may tell you to head to the hills but unless you're oriented for kingdom you're not going to know which one to do come on now i need a now word for a now situation you see, Jesus constantly moved in, in kingdom. Did you ever read the times in the Gospels? The very people he was trying to minister to rose up to kill him, and he just walked through the midst of them. That's kingdom. That is kingdom. Mike, how long are you going to live until the Father says my work is done? And I'm really tying, trying hard not to mess that up and to get out of here sooner because I'm stuck on stupid, okay? I want to take care of myself because I, I don't want to punch out early. But if I'm walking in kingdom and setting my priorities, God can even overcome a few things that I've messed up and said, you can't get out of here until you're done. Because if your heart is kingdom, what you're going to have is well done, my good and faithful servant. The kingdom.
kingdom. We have to develop a kingdom mindset. We have to cry out for kingdom. We have to seek kingdom. We have to thirst for kingdom. When we do that, Jesus promised. Now, has Jesus ever broken a promise? That's one of the reasons the book of Hebrews says that what we have is even built on better promises than that which Moses gave. Because only Messiah could bring the kingdom. That's good stuff. Father, cause us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Cause us to hunger and thirst after the kingdom. Cause us to seek first the kingdom of God. And Father, when we do, it can change the course of a nation. They can change the course of everything the enemy planned. It can change it, Father, if we'll set our priorities right. And Father, I ask right now the number one mission of the Holy Spirit on planet Earth today would be to convict the body of seeking everything but kingdom. Father, for during this time of Teshuvah, Father, let us seek the kingdom of God with all of our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name.